of the many wine bibliographies I read, Jane Lopez's vignette has to be one of my favorites. The book picked and maintained my interest throughout the whole length. Her passion for wine and struggle in her private life transpire in the book and beyond it. This episode differs from others that I have released so far, in that it is focused on the life story of the author in and out of the book, but nonetheless, I wanted to shine a light on it and I invite everybody to listen to this inspiring story. In the first part, I spoke to Jane about some of the events and emotions that she had gone through, from the beginning when she first became interested in wine, through the stress of her examination to become one of the few master sommeliers in the world, only to see it taken away in a matter of months. She shows amazing resilience and devotion, and through her story there is something that many people can relate to. In the second part we spoke about the recent sexual harassment expose in the New York Times that Jane and other 20 women were part of regarding the marked practice of senior member of the Court of Sommelier in the USA. Jane shares with me how the long plan and research article came together, how she had felt about it all and what she hopes for the future. I can only thank her for sharing her story here. Hi, I'm Matthias Carpazza, and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and winemaking can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process, and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey, Looking Into Wine. Welcome to Looking Into Wine. I'm Mattias Carpazza, and today's guest is Jane Lopes. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Jane, you are the author of Vignette, and uh, I have read your book, and uh, one of and I found a quote that you use for describing it as an educational and emotional guide to wine, and I couldn't agree more. Why do you describe it as such? Yeah, so the book is, it's sort of a, yeah, it's a combination between um, personal narrative. I don't love the word memoir. I feel like I'm too young to have a memoir, but um, but personal narrative and, uh, and wine education. So, you know, each chapter kind of narrates a, a, a story from, from my life. Um, and it, it follows a pretty kind of linear, linear path of, of sort of, sort of my life story to this point. Um, and you know, each chapter will kind of focus around a style of wine or spirits or in one occasion beer. Um, and you know, it'll kind of explain why that style kind of figured importantly at, at a time in my life. So, you know, maybe and this is something, you know, ever since I've worked in wine, I really, you know, I really remember, I think like most people in our industry do, I really remember the wines I drink quite well. I remember, you know, what I was drinking in certain moments of my life. Uh, and so, you know, these beverages become very kind of tied to to emotions and to kind of to experiences. So um kind of so I narrate that so you get kind of some of my my life story kind of coming up in the wine industry um and how how kind of I emotionally relate to to beverages um but then at the end of each chapter there's some sort of some sort of educational bit um and I try to make it really fun and engaging you know I didn't want it um I didn't want it to be dry and I wasn't trying to write you know a wine encyclopedia. It's not supposed to be sort of a, an all encompassing educational book, but I just took something that I thought was important about that style of, of beverage. And I tried to create a piece of content that I thought would be engaging both to, to kind of to experts. So kind of a new way of looking at, at something for, for experts. Um, but also really, you know, accessible for, for the novice. So, uh, they're very visual, these bits, they're maps and charts and illustrations. Um, and yeah, just kind of meant to, yeah, meant to elucidate the style, but also just have a bit of fun. While I was reading it, it really, you can sort of, if you didn't have any emotional uh, attachment to a style of wine or maybe... You can find it through reading your own stories and which you develop 
worked very well and I think it gives that extra edge to the book and I think it's brilliant and it was one of the first book one book that I read cover to cover oh, and amazing. I first read yeah I first read the the story and then I went back to see the different uh, vignettes which is the title of the book and um, <laughs> obviously the I wanted to ask it was it the um, the sto- your storyline that affected the wine choices or was the wine that chose you chose around that well, most of them, most of them actually happen. So most of them are, you know, um, it's, it's real events and it's the real beverages that were drink. And so they kind of, you know, arose together. You know, obviously I wasn't going to narrate a really, I guess it, the, the stories had to be either significant because of the beverage, but more often than not, it was significant because of the, the life event. So, you know, it's, I do a chapter kind of about my aha wine, which was, you know, an eighties, an eighties white burgundy that I drank in, you know, the mid two thousands. And so that, that obviously was a chapter that was really about that wine. And, and the, the narrative was, was only existed because of drinking that wine. But a lot of times it was the, a lot of times it was the other way around where, um, you know, it was a event, it was a, you know, it was a, a first date or a competition or studying for an exam, um, or a health issue or something like that. And I kind of, um, you know, I remembered the beverages that existed around that event, even if the beverages weren't, you know, and a crazy special bottle or something like that, that they were just sort of, you know, when I moved into my new apartment, I remember the bottles I drank and um, it was just, and maybe they weren't like the most crazy notable bottles on the planet, but I remember them because of the, the, the moment in time. Yeah, they, just have, is, they have a significant, a significant uh, attach to them. And um, I wanted to speak a bit about your life stories because from, you are born in Napa Valley and uh, you study as a Renaissance literature and then how did you end up working in the wine industry yeah you know i um yeah i studied english literature in chicago at university of chicago and and um you know (laughs) ufc is a it's a pretty amazing academic environment so like a lot of people who go there undergrad you're kind of like I want to be in academia forever. So <laughs> you, you, you play, make your grad school plan. So I was planning to, you know, I was planning to get a PhD in, in, in English literature. And so I, um, I, but I d- didn't want to write applications during my senior year. Cause you know, that just seemed overwhelming with also doing you know a senior thesis and all my coursework and extracurriculars and stuff like that. So uh, I just was going to take a year off. I actually applied to work in, the admissions department at University of Chicago, and I didn't get the job, uh, and I was pretty devastated. Um, so I just needed a job. So I was just looking on Craigslist and found, uh, you know, a listing to work in a wine shop. And I'd, I'd enjoyed wine since I studied abroad in Italy my um, my junior year in college. But I didn't know much about it. But I was said, you know, hey, that sounds like it'd be a, a pretty cool, like, gap year job. And and so, um, and I was lucky that the the man, the store manager, who's still a good friend of mine to this day, had also she'd gone to UFC for grad school. So we, <laughs> she just liked me, and we talked about UFC and and literature. And um, luckily, she didn't ask me much about wine because I really didn't know much. Uh, and. So, you know, and, and so they hired me and it was a, a pretty steep learning curve, but I, you know, it got to the point where I was coming home from work and I wanted to study wine. I didn't want to write my <laughs> my grad school application. So, you know, at a certain point I just said, well, let's see where this goes. Like, I'm not ready to abandon this yet. So, you know, the, the thought of spending my 20s kind of just in a library versus, you know, wine to me seemed to really encompass so many, so many things that I enjoyed, you know, it it is very academic and I liked to study and I didn't want to give that up, but it's also, it was social and I got to interact with people and it was also so tied to sensory experiences, um, which I really love too. You know, I love that you're studying something and then you can, you know, take a glass and swirl it and you can really connect a lot of the things that you taste and smell to what you're studying, which I just thought was the coolest thing. 
Yeah, that's the that practical part of the wine studies. And I, I guess a lot of people have started a wine journey through either a job opportunity or they look up on a bottle of wine and it was the beginning of the journey and but you went you went uh, very far in your career and you you went from barman to sommelier in in uh, was uh, Tennessee and then you went to work in uh, New York uh, how different was to move to New York and how was your experience there yeah I mean New York's an amazing city. I'd, I'd actually lived there a few summers. My sister went to school in New York. So I, a few summers during college, I went and, and I spent the summer with her. So I'd, I'd spent some time in New York. I knew I really liked it as a city. Um, you know, and, and Nashville was really good. It was an amazing experience for me. And, and I'm really grateful to, to everyone there. Um, I wasn't in the best health while I was there. So I was kind of but I didn't, I was kind of, I, I kind of tied my health to my situation, if that makes sense. And I kind of blamed, <laughs> kind of blamed Nashville for, for how I was feeling. Um, and I also, I got to the point where I sort of, I knew I wanted to sort of kick it into high gear with my wine career. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want to work at a restaurant where I was the most knowledgeable person about wine. You know, I wanted to work somewhere where I was constantly being challenged. And, um, and so I moved to New York, you know, New York is a new ball game. I think, you know, I had been a beverage director at sort of the hottest restaurant in Nashville when I was there. And so I was kind of expecting to be able to come in and sort of get whatever job I wanted, which is not how New York works. Um, so it was definitely a humbling experience, but, um, you know, it's, I really enjoy that. And it kind of just, for me, it's a challenge and it sort of just says, okay, it, it says you have to work harder. Um, so I did. And, and, you know, I eventually got to work at 11 Madison park as a sommelier, which was, which was incredible. And just a really, um, a huge growth, growth opportunity for me and just developed a, a ton there as both my kind of wine knowledge and skills, but just as also a hospitality professional and, that's what it's, you know, that's what it's all about. If you're, if you're a sommelier in a restaurant is providing a good experience and you can do that through wine knowledge and wine skills. And you can also just do that in terms of like knowing food allergies and your ability to run food and topping up people's water glasses. And, you know, those things are all super important. Absolutely. I mean, you obviously landed in one of the most if not the for many years one of the most important restaurants in the world and and definitely that was what for you has been one of the most important stage of your career uh, but while you were doing that and uh, touching on uh, your health uh, you were suffering of anxieties and you said all these very difficult uh, stages of your life and it's very emotional and while reading it you almost get to know you through your book and I wanted to ask, how did you manage your anxiety? Because you were studying for your advance for the Court of Somalia at the time. How did you manage it? And how was, how was that experience? Um, you know, I was probably in the best health of my adult life when I was leading up to the advanced, actually. I would say in the kind of, six months, six to eight months directly preceding the advanced exam. I was, I was in a good place. Um, and you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a combination of, of things. And honestly, I don't, <laughs> I don't totally understand my kind of my health problems to this day, but you know, so it's been more sort of symptom management, but, um, so, so the advance was actually pretty good. And, I, I had a bit of an episode at the advance because I took, um, I took some, some kind of real extra strength Sudafed, um, which, you know, is not legal to buy, uh, over, <laughs> over the counter in the U S anymore. Cause it's, it's what you use to make meth. So it's, um, it's, it's very much a stimulant, which I'm very sensitive to. And I kind of hadn't, uh, focused on that when I decided to take some, 
Um, you know, I think like everyone going into these exams, you're like super paranoid about your your sinuses because you're going into a tasting exam and you need to be able to smell. So, um, so you know, it was like everyone was popping Sudafed. Um, and it basically, you know, I, I, I don't know if you call it a panic, panic attack or an allergic reaction or whatever, but I like, <laughs> I like was having kind of a panic attack in terms of like, my heart was racing, but I also like couldn't move. I was like passed out on <laughs> my hotel bed and like, like finally was able to call down to the, the kind of the hotel front desk and they called the the local hospital and so I went to the emergency room the night before my my advanced exam started um but you know honestly as soon as the medication left my system it was like it was a rough you know six hours eight hours and the next morning I was fine of course everyone at the exam at that point knew that I'd gone to the hospital (laughs) the night before and so everyone's like are you okay um and so you know I think I wasn't really dealing with the lead up to the advanced exam in the way that I was the master's exam. Uh, You know, the first time I took the master's exam in 2015, and by that point you had to take theory first and pass theory before the other two sections. I was not in a good place and I had kind of just started at 11 Madison Park and was working a ton and was exhausted and, um, but, and then was also just trying to keep up with my studies. And, you know, in hindsight, my knowledge just wasn't there and I wasn't ready to pass. Um, and so I took, at that point, after I didn't pass the 2015 theory, I just, I didn't feel like I could kind of excel at 11 Madison Park and also really prepare well for the exam. So I just took a year off and I was gearing up to take it again in 2017 and I was I was going going to leave 11 Madison Park I gave my notice in November of 2016 um and just was going to take time off and study and 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 write this book um was kind of the plan and you know, of course, plans, plans never work out. And, you know, as soon as uh, an old, uh, a former manager at 11 Madison Park was working at this restaurant in Australia called Attica. And as soon as I told him I gave my notice, he, um, he said, well, great, why don't you come to Australia and be our wine director at Attica, which, you know, is where at first, you know, just were like, that's crazy. You're not gonna, we're not gonna move to Australia. That's crazy. But, you know, it's done. John, yeah, John, my, you know, husband now, my, my not even fiance, my boyfriend at the time, we just talked about it. We're like, why not? You know, this is the time in our lives where we should go off and experience a new, a new country, you know, especially one that has such amazing wine regions and restaurants and, you know, it's the same language we speak <laughs> roughly. So it was a pretty easy transition, you know? So yeah, we just said, why not? And we moved to Australia. So then I felt like, okay, I need to really focus on on my work at Attica, I can't take the MS exam this year. And so that I was gearing up for it in 2018. Um, And then, you know, I was actually feeling pretty good in the months leading up to the theory portion. Um, Between theory and uh, tasting and service, my, my health took a bit of a nosedive and I really was really, really stressed. And I think part of it was the was the stress of, of going into a service and a tasting exam. You know, those are things that are really so dependent on how you're kind of feeling and performing on that day. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can tell you a lot of things that I did. I don't know if anything was that effective. I think the most effective thing I did was just to say, okay, I'm not going to feel good. I'm going to be anxious and it's going to be okay. You know, like yeah, you, you upset it, and uh, it worked out. Yeah, where I, you know, I w- exactly where I wasn't trying to get myself to a point where I wasn't going to feel anxiety because that just wasn't realistic. So I just kind of tried to accept it, and and you know, do my best despite the challenges. Absolutely. And uh, how how was moving to Australia? What 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 was the biggest difference between like 
to working in uh, in the US and moving to Australia? Um, you know, Australia is I mean, we loved it. We had a great time over there and we just fell in love with the wine and the wine regions and you know, Australia is definitely a country that that values work life balance more than the US. Yeah. Probably more than a lot of countries and you know, especially Attica was you know, the hours were really forgiving, you know, especially for a management position. It was, um, you know, compared to what, and, and toward the end of my time at, at EMP, there was definitely a movement to cut down on people's hours, but you know, so many, so many of these fine dining restaurants in the, in the U S it's just, you know, you're working 80, 90 plus hours a week. Um, and you know, so that was that was a huge departure, and it allowed me to to you know devote time to passing the MS, and it allowed me to um, it allowed me to write this book, and so it's you know it it really you can go and sort of you know give your all for a concentrated forty five to fifty hours, and then you can still have a life beyond it. So um, that was a really big difference, and just you know I think living in a country that everyone's paid a fair minimum wage and everyone has health insurance just felt really good. Um, and I think coming back to the U S and just seeing really how many people are suffering in this country. Yeah. Um, and it seems so avoidable, yeah. you know, after living in Australia and seeing that like, Oh, there's, there's actually a way that the government can pull this off. Um, and so, you know, I, I, so that's a, a major difference and definitely one that uh, <laughs> is in the favor of, of Australia. Absolutely. And it, I mean, moving there also, it, it seems to allow you to finish your book and give you the time to explore and finish writing uh, the, whole, the whole book. And uh, I mean, there is a lot of other uh, anecdote throughout the book but one it was quite interesting for me because I did a bit of uh, traveling solo traveling myself and I wanted to and it was very interesting what well, you give suggestions so how was your experience of traveling alone in uh, Germany and now it's not possible with all the COVID but once this is over how, why would you suggest it to people to go and do solo traveling yeah I mean I I I love traveling alone I mean I think it depends on the personality type like I'm I'm I like being alone I'm very comfortable with it and I enjoy it um, but it does force you out of your comfort zone a little bit it also kind of forces you to to you know, be friendly with people you encounter. Um, obviously you want to make sure you're safe, especially as a woman. But, um, you know, when I was in Germany, I just, you know, I got a car with a good GPS and I, you know, booked little hotel rooms uh, across the country and, and I would just go and, you know, I emailed wineries and everyone was super accommodating and I would just go and I would visit with them. And then, you know, I would usually ask them like, Oh, where should I eat dinner? And they would, you know, they would, they would give me a list of suggestions. Some of them would call and make the reservation for me, um, you know, and just have, have a glass of wine and, and some local cuisine and, um, you know, and just really kind of get to absorb a place. And, you know, for me, it's especially fun. And of course, in wine regions, getting to, you know, see everything and, you know, and when you're alone, you just do things on your own schedule, your own time. You're not really, you're not really taking into account any anyone else's is travel needs. So um, I really enjoyed that, and I think for me, it really cemented my my love of of, of German wine. Absolutely, I mean, it, it's a great experience, and I done it not for wine touring, but others touring on my own, and it's fantastic. And I think it's a great great experience to done to to be done. And I mean. There is, there's another couple of things about the book and I wanted to ask it. Yeah, there, there's, I mean, there's so many different images and there was one that struck me about your cat, Bo. And obviously, where, where, where does it take your name and why is it so important? How is it her? Sure. Um, so her name is, yeah, it's Bo for short, but full name is Betritus. <laughs> um, I got her in Chicago. She was got her from a, a shelter. So she was a stray. 
Um, and a friend of mine uh, came with me, a friend of mine who had a car, <laughs> said she wouldn't be willing to drive me in. Um, I'd actually gone the month before with my mom and my mom was in town and we kind of checked out the, the cats and kind of had my eye on her. And then when I went back with my friend and she was still there, I decided to, 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 to go ahead and get her. And, and my, my friend who also worked in wine suggested, uh, Betritus as a name, which, you know, sounded like a mouthful, but then Bo is just, you know, that's easy. That's a nice, a nice cat name. So, so she became, um, she became Betritus, which seemed appropriate for her (laughs) as I, I kind of use her as a metaphor to explain the concept of Betritus in the book, um, and different illustrate illustrations of how, Botrytis can be, um, you know, a little a little rotten. <laughs> it, you know, it is associated with rot, but it's also associated with sweetness. And um, so, sort of used use the cat as a metaphor to explain botrytis. And um, my illustrator had uh, was was so amazing. And you know, I sent her all these pictures of Bo and then she said well can you I need to see her moving can you send some video and so I would take videos of Bo and send them to her and she said well it's, I'm just really not getting the full effect can I come <laughs> over and just see <laughs> so which is great I mean she's amazing so she came over and she met Bo and so you know it was funny because both myself and the publisher were kind of like it's fine. Like whatever you have, I'm sure is going to be fine. And she was like, no, no, I really need to capture the authentic bow. And so, you know, at the time I was like, wow, this is a little over the top, but, but definitely in hindsight and with the result in the book, I'm, I'm super glad that, that she, uh, took, took the time to, to make sure Bo was, was perfect. (laughs) I mean, once again, the book is called Vignette and, um, uh, before, um, I finish. Uh, we, I mean, before we have actually this conversation, uh, in the last, uh, in the last, I think, few months or a couple of years, you had uh, some, I would say, other chapters, and you haven't written the book, but there's some important things have happened to your life, and uh, and uh, most recently there was uh, this article that had come out, uh, an expose uh, written by Julia Maskin in October. It was uh, three months ago. And I, and it was about uh, harassment uh, and all these other situations have happened in, in the court of so many years. And I wanted to ask uh, what prompted to speak up. And um, you know, I I have to give a lot of credit to Victoria James and Liz Dowdy. Um, you know, Victoria had been um involved, and you know, I highly recommend her book, Wine Girl. And she details some of the, you know, sexual assault that she's endured in her life. And so she's really been a resource and advocate for other women in the industry who've experienced this sort of behavior. And so when Julia Moskin had written an article um, about a year previous to this one, detailing just a, a single individual who had, um, who had, you know, perpetrated some pretty serious sexual assault and rape against a number of women. And so um, Victoria kind of acted, she didn't have an experience with this man, but she kind of acted as a liaison to talk to, to some of these women. And, and at the time there was a lot of, of discussion about master sommeliers and a lot of women kind of had started to come forward to her and other people about, about experiences they'd had with master sommeliers. But no one was ready to go forward at that point. And, you know, the CMS still, and but, but particularly at the time, had had such sway in the industry. And so people were afraid of of of, of speaking out against against these men and against the institution. So so that was kind of tabled. And then, you know, throughout 2020, there was um there was much more of a pushback against the CMS. Um, you know. In in June of of 2020, when a lot of businesses and individuals were coming out in support of Black Lives, um, the CMS wouldn't do it, and it was a frustration for many and and many uh, several um, master sommeliers resigned in in the wake of that, and there was just more comfort with speaking out against. 
um, uh, against the CMS and against master sommeliers. And on top of that, um, I, Liz Dowdy had heard uh, a basically a, a statement from the CMS that um, that you know, well, we may not have the most diversity in our ranks, but look at look at how far we've come with women. And <laughs> Liz was kind of like, no, no, you don't get to use us when your track record with women is actually really terrible to defend, you know, your, your possible possibility in kind of the realms realm of diversity. So, so Liz, you know, Liz and Victoria started talking um, and they came to me and, and, you know, honestly, when they first came to me, I kind of really, um, you know, downplayed my own experiences and I, really hadn't thought they were a big deal. And I felt like I was kind of like got out of, of things pretty lucky, you know, easy in, in, the, in the scheme of things. And so, you know, I said, I kind of said, well, yeah, I, you know, I, I really think that there's a lot of bad things going on and I would, you know, I would love to help you because I kind of have a little bit of a different circle um, and I'm happy to reach out to, to my contacts and I'm happy to talk to people. But I kind of like, in the beginning, I just didn't, you know, I thought I was going to be this sort of like resource, but like, you know, sort of invisible behind the scenes. Um, and then it kind of became pretty clear to me that like, it wasn't appropriate for me to just kind of, you know, be a support system, but but not actually sort of, um, you know, put put myself on the line yeah. with with these women. So so I kind of made that decision of like I should go on record too about my experience. And and you know, I think we all have different reactions to encountering behavior like that. And my reaction had been very much to normalize it and very much to kind of accept it. And, you know, and even feel like gratitude that it didn't go further than it did. And then I thought that, you know, I, at first I was kind of ashamed of that behavior, but I realized that that's like, you know, it's something valuable to, to recognize and discuss at the very least. Um, that, that kind of was my impulse and how to handle it. And I think it, it is for a lot of women. The article, I'm going to link it in the end. I'm going to link it. It's very goes in a lot of details and I invite everybody who hasn't read it to, to go and read it. Um, I mean, what, what have been the reaction from the involved people in your own experience? And if there's any, how, how did you felt that the, the court reacted? Well, you know, I think, um, I think the court sort of has, has, done sort of the the minimum thus far um you know at first they came out with like a really generic statement of like we're sorry that i don't even think they said they're sorry but we you know we would hate for anyone you know involved to kind of feel any harm like it was just very generic there was no there was no taking responsibility there was no apology there was nothing and you know to the credit of this industry, people kept pushing them and kept saying this is an, an acceptable reaction and including members of the organization. So, you know, the board, the existing board, the board of time has now resigned. They elected a new board. Um, I, you know, I still don't think, I don't, I still don't think they've done a good job of of trying to, I guess, um, address the harm that they've done. And I think that a lot of the focus within the organization has been on how do we, you know, how do we move on? How do we, how do we re, how do we reorganize ourselves that, so that this doesn't happen again, so that, you know, we regain the trust of, of the industry and that, you know, the, the CMS continues to kind of do what it has done is sort of the attitude, um, that I get from the, from the organization instead of really saying, how do we address the harm that we've already done and how do we become an organization that, that doesn't do harm, <laughs> you know? Um, and so how do we really become a positive force 
in in the industry. And I don't think that those steps have been taken yet. Um, I think there are a lot of good people within the organization. I think there are a lot of good people on the board. Um, but I think, you know, I think it, it will end up needing to be a radical change. Okay. I mean, it's all people that you've known for, for a number of years, for your studies, and, and it must be difficult to, to look at and live through. And uh, well, well, given uh, given the people who have haven't come out, uh, what sort of suggestion or where do you would you suggest to someone going to speak out? Obviously, it's not an easy task. So, I wonder where where would you suggest the people to go? Um. Well, it's tough, and you know, I think we really. We really trusted Julia Moskin at the New York Times with, with the story. And obviously she's done a lot of work like this before. And she's, a, you know, the New York Times is such, you know, has such strict journalistic standards. Um, so that was kind of an easy decision to go with her. Um, there is a, you know, there's a, a hotline with the CMS that people can report, um, report, any instances of, you know, discrimination or abuse to. Um, I do think that they are listening to those and they're being passed along to a lawyer to investigate. Um, what will be done with that investigation, we're not sure yet. So it's, you know, it's, I still think that it's a little bit, it's a little bit trust, tough to trust, you know, the, the organization that has kind of fostered this, this harm. Um, there are, you know, there are lots of organizations out there in general that provide resources for women that have been victims of sexual abuse. And, um, I know you're going to post a few of them that I, that I gave you. And this was honestly sort of a new world to me. And I've become friends with a woman named Sarah Fernandez, who, um, who was in the, the first Julia Moskin article. Um, and so she, and she's doing a, a lot of really amazing work in, in this space of, um, you know, just changing the, the, the culture of around, you know, around consent. And I think especially in the wine industry, you know, that's so has historically been so fueled by sort of late night get togethers and after hours and drinking and stuff that there's been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of sexual assault and abuse and harassment and we just need to kind of reframe, um, reframe how how we interact with each other and look at these things. There's there's going to be some educating needing, and as you said, you sent me all a link of uh, a PDF with all the association, which I'm going to post it on my website and on the link as well on on the notes. And I mean, looking looking at the future, what, where do you hope? we should go and where do you think we should make a change? You know, I think, I think the wine industry is a bit behind a lot of other industries in terms of um, where we need to be on a lot of, of social, I guess you could call them social issues, um, including sort of, you know, sexual harassment and gender, gender discrimination, but also including, you know, healthcare and uh, general labor practices are really bad. And, but then also, you know, I, I just feel like the, the finance, the kind of the financial necessities of this industry has, has um, encouraged a lot of these bad practices. And so we need to look at that as well. And we need to change that. And if, you know, if restaurants can't survive paying their employees a living wage, then they shouldn't survive. Then, you know, they're not viable businesses. And we need to think about another way that that structure exists so that everyone who's who works in it can, you know, can be paid a living wage and have health insurance. And if that industry can't support those things, then the industry needs to change. Um, so I think, you know, uh, there are lots of organizations that have existed before this year and that or before 2020 or that, that, that cropped up in 2020. And I think there are definitely some more in the works. And I, I think, you know, um, I think, I think we need to come together as an industry 
and create institutions that really um, support and protect individuals, but also businesses. Because, you know, you look at 2020 in, you know, let's say wine retail um, and wine.com is having their best year ever. And a lot of these smaller wine shops are, you know, are struggling. Um, and restaurants, of course, have, <laughs> have had the, the toughest, you know, the toughest year ever. And I think we just need to um, come together to, to kind of figure out how we can support the, you know, the independent businesses and the individuals in this industry. Absolutely. I mean, 2024 has been a great, has been a year where a lot of people have spoke up. There's been a lot of movement across many industries and many different associations have come up. And I think going forward, hopefully, I hope there will be a better future and hopefully nobody will have to experience what you have experienced and many other women would have to experience and add the other problem of the industries. I really enjoyed speaking to you. And uh, again, uh, you, you wrote this amazing book called Vignette and I wanted to thank you again for your time and to come in here and uh, talking about your, your stories and everything. Um, thank you. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was great talking to you. You joined the conversation on looking into wine with Jane Lopez. I would like to truly thank Jane to share her story and to share her insight here. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe to get the all the notification of the new future episode coming and remember to tell your friends. Also, go to mattiascarpazza.com where you can get the links for the sexual harassment helpline and you can also support the growth of the podcast in the donation box. The next episode will be on the practices and techniques used in, the bi in biodynamics. What are they? Where are they from? And who invented them? A special thanks again to today's guest, Jane Lopez. Music produced by Samuele Di Nardo. Editing and mastering by Tommaso Ascoli.